Dr. Emmanuel Bottio. He has been trained in Belgium at UCL for its medical doctorate at ULB for internal medicine and Antwerp University and uh, Institute of Tropical Medicine for his PhD. He is currently head of the unit of tropical diseases at the Antwerp Institute of Tropical Medicine. He has published numerous papers on the clinical management of NTDs and particularly Chagas disease. Please, Dr. Bottio, tell us why Chagas disease is so a neglected disease in Europe. Okay, thank you for this, uh, this nice introduction, this nice invitation. And after two brilliant presentations, I will have a topic much more focused on, on a specific disease, an exemplary disease indeed. Uh, so, Chagas disease, I would like just starting by acknowledging the, the, the help of uh, uh, Yves Carlier and uh, Karine Trayens to prepare this, this presentation, especially because they, 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 they started to gather a lot of information in Belgium and, and in Europe also. Uh, about the, this neglected disease, it started in 2000 and then we had several meetings and workshops in WHO level even to try to, to, to bring this topic more uh, at a higher level in the, in the health agenda. Just briefly, uh, some clinical aspect for those of you who don't know the disease at all, uh, which is possible of course, and then I will go more on to the epidemiology, but focusing on the epidemiology in Europe, uh, so outside Latin America, which is the traditional um, countries, areas of uh, endemic disease, uh, endemicity, and then a few words on diagnosis and treatment. So Chagas disease, as maybe some of you know, is a disease which is transmitted by a vector in Latin America. Uh, after the, the infection, some people can develop an acute phase, which is uh, characterized by fever, uh, some swelling at the place of the infection, the skin swelling or sometimes in uh, conjunctival swelling as you can see here. And uh, thereafter, which is very specific for this disease, there are other ones uh, developing this way also, but it starts a very long period of latency, which means that the parasites remain in, in the body, in some tissue, in the, in the heart, but not causing any symptoms at all. Uh, we call this phase indeterminate form. There is no clinical symptom, there is no abnormalities if you look at the electrocardiogram. And then a part of the pa infected patient, about 30%, will develop the Chagas complication. And we call it the chronic phase with determinate form, which is cardiac complication or digestive complication. I will not go so much into the, the details, but also it's of course a question why 30% develop problems and 70% uh, can live uh, their whole life with a parasite. But this is a, a frequent problem in parasitic disease, in infectious disease. On top of this classic description of uh, Chagas disease, I think it's important to uh, realize that we have also the problem of uh, immunosuppression, which, which can reactivate the Chagas disease. This has been well uh, demonstrated with clinical cases. But we see more and more people having immunosuppressive conditions, treatment or diseases. So we have to consider Chagas disease in this uh, context also. Uh, and it, like tuberculosis, like many other diseases, like toxoplasmosis, it can cause a kind of toxoplasmosis, uh, like uh, cerebral abscess, for example, in immunosuppressed patients. We have uh, heard about the congenital transmission and congenital infection, where Neonates can develop acute symptoms of develop thereafter the chronic disease and I should have put a six person risk of transmission instead of two or two five which is uh, mostly reported in the literature. And then we have this risk of secondary transmission which is important for Europe and non-endemic countries but I come back to that in the next slides. Uh, of course, you know Chagas disease is a disease from Latin America, from Mexico to Argentina with 7 to 10 million uh, trypanosoma crudsi infected uh, people um, nowadays, uh, especially, uh, and now I would say the hyperendemic areas of Chagas disease nowadays are really the, what we call the Gran Chaco, uh, which is a, a region between Bolivia, Brazil, Argentina, and Paraguay. There, there is still a lot high, high transmission level. But of course, the, the disease is widespread in uh, whole Latin America, as we have seen. Uh, uh, Honduras, uh, Mexico as well. And what is important is that 
of the disease was focused because of the, the vector is only is limited. The vector which transmit the, the Chimpanzoma cruzae is limited to Latin America areas. It, it has been limited for a long time only in Latin America, Central and South America. But you know uh, the movement of people since 10, 15 years, uh, 25 years. So we have seen more and more cases of Chagas infection also outside uh, Latin America. Of course, first in the United States, uh, which close link uh, with Latin America, but also in many other countries uh, like Europe, Australia and Japan, the non-endemic countries. And uh, this publication tried to gather the evidence, uh, the best evidence at that time, it was uh, around 2010, to know how, to quantify this problem, how many people are infected with Chagas outside Latin America. It was estimated 300,000 in the United States. Of course, in Spain, in Europe, because of the historical link, they had a lot of uh, millions of Latin American migrants, so they estimated at that time uh, 50,000 uh, 50, cases. There were also cases estimated in Japan, Canada, much less, of course. But we had not uh, no ID in other European countries. Spain at that time was really, uh, of course, uh, interested in, in, in looking at that more in details. But we had almost no data in, for the, the other European countries. Although there are also Latin American migrants in, in Belgium, Germany, and, and Italy. And so this is a busy slide, but just to, to show you that at, at that moment, around 2010, 2011, I think, uh, we had a, a meeting in WHO in uh, Geneva, trying to gather the information, and if Carlier participated and gather, first we had to try to estimate how many Latin American migrants were present in, in European countries. So not that easy, because you have the regular immigration, but you have also the the undocumented migrant, which is of course extremely difficult to, to quantify. But anyway, at that moment, more or less, we had we could uh, have this this broad this idea that about three three million people, uh, three million American migrants are living in Europe uh, at that time, a few years ago. But and you see that we could consider about fifty thousand. This is the, uh, in, in uh, 50,000 Latin American migrants living, living in Belgium. Now, based on the prevalence of the disease in each of the different countries of Latin America, and of course the proportion of these migrants in the, we, 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 you can see then thereafter in, in different European countries, there was some estimate that probably uh, we, there was about, let's say, 100,000 persons infected with Trypanosoma cruzae, uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in Europe. Uh, and probably in Belgium, about 600 to, to, to 1,000, something like that. These are, of course, this is based really on, I will not say ex speculation, but at least extrapolation of the population movement and prevalence in the origi uh, origin country. Now, I think this publication has helped a lot to better quantify. This is a systematic review and meta-analysis, which has been published a few years ago. Uh, trying to really gather all studies, epidemiological studies uh, conducted in Europe, in primary care, in blood uh, bank, uh, in uh, maternal services, in prenatal care. And uh, I think we can now have a kind of, uh, I would not say a consensus, but at least a kind of reference a num uh, per percentage, about 4%. Four, four uh, this is a little bit different with, was, with what was uh, expected before, because based on this calculation from the population in Latin America, we were thinking that two or three percent of the Latin American migrants would be infected. It's a little bit higher, but of course, it depends on a lot of the, the population. If you see, for example, population from Bolivia, uh, it's, maybe you cannot see it, but it's about 18 percent prevalence of Chagas disease in uh, Bolivian uh, Latin um, uh, immigrants. So there are a lot of differences. But I think this four person is probably now what is accepted in the international community for, for this. Uh, what we have seen at that time during this meeting as well is that when you consider now the number of cases which has been effectively diagnosed in Belgium and in other European countries in 2010, and, uh, and of course the estimates, uh, we could say that about 95 person, more than 95 person of the cases, true cases, uh, actual cases of infection, are probably not diagnosed in Belgium, but in other countries. Maybe Spain at that time did a little bit better than other European countries. So there was a huge 
uh, under diagnosis. And uh, trying to find data again, I would like to thank uh, Yves Carlier and Karine Trayens because they really uh, have uh, gathered the information. Of course, these are small numbers, but we have several hundred of tests done each year, and we find 10 to 15 cases per year. Uh, and I would say the last time uh, you see between 2011 and 2017, more than 1,000 requests for Chagas serology, for Chagas testing, and about 5% are found positive. So if you look for patients, in, even in Belgium, uh, of course, if you look in the, in the good, uh, in the exposed uh, population, you will find case and you will make diagnosis. And I, I must say that the, the number of requests increase and the number of uh, patients we diagnose increase in the last year, showing that there is some awareness among clinicians and among the different uh, disciplines. So, now what, why is it important to diagnose Chagas in transmit infection? Because most people are just asymptomatic, they are not that sick, uh, or they could become sick later, of course. You see the transmission routes in uh, endemic countries, vector-borne and oral transmission have been described, of course, in Latin America. But when you see non-endemic countries, these two routes of transmission do not exist. But we still remain with the risk of vertical transmission and congenital infection. We remain with the risk of blood donation. You can transmit the infection by, by giving blood and of course this risk of transplantation. So what, uh, how is uh, Europe prepared to, to control these, these emerging disease, let's say, in, in, our, in our countries? This is also another nice paper trying to, dis to describe and to summarize all control intervention in uh, European countries. It was published uh, in 2015, but on data from 2000, 2010, just showing that, for example, blood transfusion at that time, uh, it was n it, the, the, the screening of Chagas disease were, were a kind of national regulation in some countries, but in many other countries it was not really done, or it was at least just a kind of European recommendation, but not r really uh, implemented. I must say that nowadays, at least in Belgium, but in many other countries, this has become really something which is systematically done. Since a few years, in, uh, in, in Flanders, in, in Wallonia, in Brussels, we screen, because it's a, it's a divided uh, competence in, in Belgium, but we screen uh, systematically now uh, all Latin American or all Belgian exposed with long uh, travel, long stay, sorry, in Latin America, they are screened for Chagas disease and they are deferred uh, at, at least at the beginning, uh, up to during a few months after, after the travel. So this is now systematic uh, and thanks to this we have found some cases of infection and looking back we have found that this person who were just regular blood donor had already transmitted the infection to some persons uh, in, um, I, I remember a case we have even published. We uh, one person had transmitted to three different um, persons in Belgium, and we could found them back. Thanks to, to the screening. Now organ transplantation, of course, again it's a new, it's more a European recommendation. Uh, you see, most are it's not really a national legislation. None of those uh, countries are in green, but I can say that. At least in the professional bodies in the transplantation medicine and uh, as a, I, in a broader picture also the, the all uh, sp uh, disciplines uh, specializes in immune, immune problems, uh, the screening for Chagas disease has become also a, a kind of systematic uh, recommendation. I would not say it's done every, each time, but at least it's part now of the recommendation by most uh, professional bodies uh, and different experts. Now the congenital transmission and the vertical transmission. I'm sorry to to see that uh, to tell you that uh, there was there is no really recommendation of standard at this moment. Uh, you see, all the countries in Europe are in red, almost all are red. Uh, it has changed a little bit, but I must say that uh, the prevention of genital trans congenital transmission relies mostly on the let's say the clinical decision of the clinical, uh, uh, the clinical discretion. There are some gynecologists aware of this problem who will test systematically their patient and others probably are not aware and we will not test it. I cannot say that there is really a systematic screening which is done in prenatal care or even better before uh, conception because uh, 
we will see that, that the treatment for, of Chagas cannot be given to pregnant women. So it, ideally, you should uh, screen and diagnose before the pregnancy. And so diagnosis, uh, acute Chagas, most of the time you make the diagnosis by finding the parasites in the blood. Uh, and indeed, we have this problem of the diagnostic issue that we need at least two tests, which uh, two different tests should be positive, and we have this problem of discordant results. Uh, this has been mentioned in the previous talk. And also molecular methods, at least here, are not that sensitive. It's not because you, the PCR is negative that the patient is not infected. The sensitivity is about 50 to 70 percent. So it's not yet the perfect tool for, for, for diagnosis. <laughs> Uh, chronic uh, Chagas and uh, chronic disease uh, is based also on uh, surgical testing and PCR when, when, uh, when available. Now, in Europe, in Belgium, I think everywhere in the world, I think everybody agrees that we should treat Chagas infection in, in, in neonates, uh, in, in children. Why? Because uh, we have a high um, probability of curing completely these, these, uh, these neonates uh, who are infecting during congenital transmission. Acute Chagas should be treated also systematically. We have a high, uh, you, you would prevent chronic complication, chronic infection, but also you have a high probability of cure. It becomes more difficult for the indeterminate form as soon as you do the diagnosis quite early in young adults or adolescent or ch women in childbearing age, you should treat, of course, uh, but uh, it's less clear when people get uh, older. You, you, you see in this second part, this second graph, that the cure rate when you are chronically infected is much lower with the current drug. It's about 50%, uh, it's not 100% cure rate. And you give drugs which are quite toxic. Chagas reactivation should be treated systematically. If you plan to immunosuppress a patient, or if a patient becomes immunosuppressed, you plan a transplantation, we should screen and treat those patients uh, prior to the, to, the, to the transplantation. Then the chronic phase, when the, there is already a chronic complication, cardiac, then unfortunately the benefit study, it's the next slide, which has been published last year in New England, has shown that you have no benefit, no clinical benefit. When you treat, when people have already developed cardiopathy or digestive complication, at that time it's a little bit too late, right? So you give the treatment, you will see probably the PCR becoming negative, but there is no difference for the clinical outcome. So it's a bit too late, so it's a call also to try to diagnose much earlier than when complications are already there. <laughs> Okay, so no clinical benefit. And then I finish with the current treatment. Unfortunately, we have two drugs. They are not perfect, but they have a lot of, also a lot of uh, side effects. I would say that the first one, Basnidazole, is better tolerated. So it's the first line treatment. You, don't, you, don't, you can get it by um, writing a mail to WHO and you, they send the drug. It's not uh, commercially available, of course, in Europe. Nifurtimox is a second line treatment which is very badly tolerated. There is almost nobody who can go up to the end of the treatment of two or three months which is recommended. So just to conclude uh, about this topic of Chagas in Europe, I think we can say that uh, probably there are, but it's changing, it's evolving. There are many Latin American migrants going back to, to, to Latin America from Spain because of the crisis. So, but there are about three million uh, people Latin American migrants in Europe, uh, and about 100,000 of them are infected with Trypanosoma cruzi without most of the time knowing it. And we have probably several hundreds of infection unrecognized in Belgium for the moment. No, more than 90% are not diagnosed, as I told you. Uh, 50K has been diagnosed since 2011 to 2007, so it is increasing, but 50K when you have probably several hundreds of cases, it's not enough, right? So we have to, to do better. We have to still increase awareness, but you have to contact, yeah, a primary care physician, cardiologist, gynecologist, neonatologist, pediatrician, uh, gastroenterologist, there are so many disciplines who, which can be involved in, in care of uh, Chagas patients. Uh, it's always difficult when you have to, to have this kind of fragmented message to, to many different disciplines. But I can say that the blood transfusion, blood safety has increased everywhere in Europe and in Belgium also. Transplantation probably also. 
I think we can still may do better for prevention of congenital transmission. In some hospitals, all Latin American um, pregnant women are tested, but in others, it's not yet the case. We have to, to improve that for, for Belgium. Uh, and we still have a lot of problems in diagnosis, but this is not for Belgium or Europe. It's a general problem with Chagas research. Diagnosis treatment is absolutely not perfect at that moment, and we have unfortunately no test of cure for the moment. Thank you for your attention.